Hi, this is Natalie. Thank you for listening to Crossroads Church, where we are bringing a real God to real people. I believe you'll be inspired by today's message. Hey, I'm Joel. I'm the teaching guy around here, and I serve under Pastor Marcus and Natalie, our senior pastors, and uh, we're continuing our series today called Build It. I want to say something real quick. You know, when we do this prayer time in the morning uh, in the third song, I think it's probably one of the most important things that happens on a Sunday morning is a prayer time. Uh, but I've heard so many people are going through so many struggles right now, just hard times, like family issues, relational issues, you know, marriage, finances. And um, you know, every, every morning, uh, every Sunday morning, my wife and I, we live in Kerrville now, but I'm going to talk a little bit about that in a minute. And we drive an hour and a half from Kerrville to here on Sunday mornings, all on Interstate 10. And I had this thought this morning. I thought, you know, Interstate 10 is constantly under construction. And I started thinking, you know, God's work in our life is kind of like the construction on Interstate 10. It never ends. And it's messy, and it's frustrating, and it's challenging while it's going on. And just when you think it's done, they go tear up another section, don't they? It reminds me of that verse that says, he who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it. Like God's got the big picture of your life and what you can be and what you have the potential to be and what he knows you have within you, and he's going to stop at nothing to get the construction work done to build you into who he wants you to be. So if you're going through a hard time right now, I just want to encourage you, uh, don't lose heart, as the Apostle Paul says, for this light and momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory, which is beyond all comparison. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, all the construction, but on what is unseen, because what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen, what he's doing on the long-term basis is eternal. So I, I'm confident that God is working in your life no matter how, how hard it's been getting. So that's my prayer for you guys this morning is that you keep your eyes fo- focused on that. Now, we're going we're gonna to do a, uh, our talk today about something that's really, really important. But before we do it, I'm going to tell uh, a little bit about myself, a little self-disclosure, but I need to make sure that y'all don't judge me, Okay. So I would, I, would, I would ask everybody in the room, please, please raise your right hand and repeat after me. I swear I will not judge Joel for being a horrible person. All right, you promise now. Okay. So as I tell these stories, if I see judgmental looks from you, I'm going to be like, hey, hey, you promised. All right. So over the last year, uh, we have been working on building a retreat center out in Kerrville, Texas. I've talked a lot about it. Uh, it's part of the reason we did this series called Build It. And it has been hard and miserable. And I have felt alone and I have felt angry. It, it's just been like, it's brought out the worst in me. And people know that we're working on this project. And, and wonderful, loving people will often come up to me and be like, hey, how's the project going? And I dread that question. Because depending on the week, it was probably hell. So I can't answer, well, it's hell, thanks. You know, thanks for reminding me. I tried to escape and here. And it's been really hard. And sometimes I have, like, I've, I've learned, I avoid certain people. Like, th- there's this place I go in Kerrville that I know to just avoid certain people because they're going to be like, hey, how's that project going? And I'm like, I don't even want to talk to you. Don't ask. I don't want to know. But, but uh, like, a few weeks ago, uh, Pastor Marcus was asking me how the project's going. And I was like, to be honest, it stinks. It's horrible. I'm miserable and I hate life. And he's like, well, let me, let me send some people to help you. And he sent this army of people out from this church. And they got more work done in a day than I could have done in weeks on my own. And I remember thinking, I love people. <laughs> and here's what I know about everybody in this room. We've got a love-hate relationship with people, don't we? Like some, some days, and some of us lean more to this way most of the time, right? Some of us are like, people, just leave me alone. I just don't want people. They... they they're mean and nasty and they're irresponsible and undependable. I just, people just leave me alone. Let me live my life. And then some of us are like, oh, I feel so alone. I wish people really knew me. And what's wild about this is sometimes I'll feel this way in the morning and then this way in the afternoon. I'm like, I need people. I don't want people. People, people. Uh, uh, uh. Some days I love people. I'm like, oh man, people are amazing. Humanity. And other days I'm like, oh, humanity. And I've seen this with people too, that, that, that sometimes, man, maybe you hang out in this corner and, and like, you're actually surrounded by people, but you actually feel really alone. 
And, and, and there's certain personality types, right? I'm an introverted personality type. So being around a lot of people wears me out. Sundays after church, I go home and I take a very long nap because I'm just worn out. People suck it out of me. I'm just kidding. It's just the nature of who I am. But then there's extroverted people. They get around people and they just want more people. My wife is extroverted. We'll go to a party. I'll come home. I'm like, man, I'm toast. And she's like, let's keep partying. Like, guys. <laughs> She's just a party animal when she's around people. And so we all lean one way, right, and, or another. Some of us love people. Some of us just get worn out by people. And, and sometimes we're like, man, I love people. And other times you're like, oh, they're so horrible. And, and maybe sometimes it, you feel that way about your own family. You're like, man, I feel, I wish my, you know, I feel like my own spouse doesn't even know me. And maybe you're afraid to, you know, be honest with your spouse because you're like, well, I don't know. I saw how she responded that way. And I can't tell her honestly how I feel about this or Sometimes in church, we're this way. We're like, people just, I know I need to be in church, but people just leave me alone. So we sneak in the back and leave before the service is over so that nobody has to mess with you. you know, I've been there. I've done that. We have this weird love-hate relationship with people. And, and, and let's be honest about it. People issues are usually the most painful ones. You know, you can, you know, financial struggles, money's a little bit tight, that's frustrating, work struggle, but, but the stuff that really gets to you, the stuff that keeps you up at night is the relational stuff, isn't it? That relationship with your son or your daughter, you're just watching them just destroy their life and you're like, oh. and you're trying to get through to them, but you can't. You're like, what is wrong with them? And you see friends doing things that are just destroying their life and you're like, people, why are you so, and you're like, why are people so stupid? And we have this weird love-hate relationship with people. And, and the, ch the challenge is people are super important. But a lot of times we don't. I, I heard somebody say this this week. They said this, I'd just rather be alone and guarded than reveal my true self and get rejected. Some of us, the reason we're alone is like, well, I feel alone, but I'd rather be alone than, I, 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 branched, I ventured out that one time and man, I got burned. So I'll just keep to myself and stay away, and we'll just, me and people will be kept at a distance. So we got to figure out, what do we do with this complicated relationship we have with people? Because God loves people. In fact, there's a verse that you all know it, John 3, 16. says this, for God so loved the world, he loved the world so much. And when he says world, he's talking about people. People is the world. It's not that he loved the trees and the birds and the animals. God loved the world so much that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. People, the irritating ones, the nice ones, all of them, were so important to God that he gave his own son. And his son came down and he forgave us of all of our sins, all of our shortcomings, and he made a path for us to be in right relationship with God the Father. And then he said this, right before he left the earth, he called all of the disciples together. And he said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you. And surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age. Here's my translation of what Jesus said. Hey, I love you, you people. Now, I want you to go and let everybody else know that they're loved by me. I want you to go build a community or a family of Christ followers. And that's what discipleship is, right? It's not just like, hey, everybody, let's get together and hang out. Like there's intentionality to it. And that's why the church is different than any other social institution out there. It says Jesus is actually with us in the church. The spirit of God actually lives in the church. Sure, you can be part of Rotary Club, but the spirit of God isn't driving the Rotary Club, right? Maybe you can be part of all these different organizations, but if you want to be part of the organization that really is going to be the force for change in the world and the force for strength in your life, it's going to be getting where the Spirit of God is. And he says, if you go build this community, I'll be right in the middle of the community, and I'll build you into who you have the potential to be. But the challenging part about it is we only grow into the fullness of all we're supposed to be when we're around other people. And I don't like that because I'd like to grow on my own. <laughs> People get in the way. People get up in my business. You know, there's a verse in Proverbs that says, wounds from a friend can be trusted, but an enemy multiplies kisses. You know you've got a real friend on your hands when they're willing to tell you something you don't want to hear, but you need to hear it. I can't tell you how many times in my life 
because I was involved in community. I'll, I'll never forget one time. I got so mad at this guy one time. I was in college. I was about to go and tell him off. Just tell him off. I got in my car. I left school early, and I'm driving just angry, man. I'm driving. It was, on, it was in Corpus Christi. I'll never forget where I was. I was driving down the, the um, Shoreline Drive, and all of a sudden, I get a phone call from a friend of mine from our church, and he called me. He's like, stop. Stop whatever you're doing. I was like, oh. He's like, I don't know what you're doing, but God told me to call you and say, stop, you're about to do something stupid. (laughs) And I was like, I just pulled over and started crying. And he's like, what are you doing? I'm like, I'm going to go tell this guy off. He's like, don't do that. Don't do it. And sure enough, man, if I would have done that, it would have ruined a bunch of stuff in my life. But because I had been around guys that told me stuff I didn't want to hear, it has saved me a lot of pain. And it's been a tremendous blessing. And a lot of times in our lives, when you're in community, like, we don't like it. We don't like people getting up in our business. I've heard people say this, man, I feel judged by the church. But when it comes down to it, what it really was, was somebody in the church saw them living short of what they had the capacity to become, and they called them out on it and said, you're better than that. You've got more in you than that. And, and, but what they instead said was, well, they're judging me. No, they weren't judging. It's not judging when somebody's calling greatness out of you. And you know you've got a real good friend and a real good community around you when they're willing to say, hey man, you got way more in you than that. Step up. Be all you can be. And look, I don't like hearing I'm not being all I can be. I'd rather people say, you're great just like you are. But you know you and I know you, me and, and we're not great just like we are. And sometimes people are like, you're okay, just accept yourself as you are. You're like, I don't like who I am. That's not a good friend. A good friend is somebody who says, hey, you're not all you could be, but man, I know what you have the capacity to be. Let's walk this journey together, become more like Christ together, and you can become way more than you are right now. That's what community is for. So we're talking about this idea that the community is growth and refining through relationships with others. It's becoming all you can be, but you can't do it alone. And I've heard people say, man, you know, well, me and Jesus got it all figured out, but they're mean and nasty people. See, you man, Jesus may have it all figured out, but it's how you relate to others that proves it. And this is where community comes in. We've been talking over the last few weeks about this idea that the, the, the series is called Build It, where Jesus said, those of you who take my words and you apply them to your life, you're like somebody who builds their house on a rock. When things get crazy and the world gets out of control and people, just insanity is everywhere, you're going to be standing firm and not shaken by the winds or the waves or the whatever it is that's blowing through. And we talked last week about how the Logos, the Word of God, God's truth revealed in Scripture, God's truth revealed through Jesus, and now through Scripture, is the foundation to build your life on. There's an answer for every challenge you're going through somewhere in the Bible. And it's usually in the form of a principle that says, if you do this, you'll get this. It's not black and white thinking, it's principle-based thinking, where it says, if you do this, you'll get this. Because remember, you know, if you ever need, if you ever get a new house, and you're like, I don't understand why this isn't working, you can always go to the builder, and the builder can tell you what's going on, because they have an intricate knowledge of everything going on behind the scenes in the house they built. And God, our Father, He built you. He knows how you're wired. He built this world. And every answer you're looking for somewhere And it may not look like you think it should, but it's somewhere in the logos. The word of God is the foundation that we build upon. But today I want to talk about the importance of community. Because I believe that community is the frame and the roof above us. Community helps kind of protect us. It gives us boundaries. And Lord knows we all need some boundaries. Some of us are prone to be a little wild. And we need somebody that says, hey, 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 don't do that. That's not good for you. Community, it's, it's also a place of safety. You know... I could never have built this retreat center that we've been building apart from God sending us people that have helped us. And I'm so grateful for that. But if I wasn't in community, I wouldn't have any of that. And this is something I've seen. Look, I've been hanging out in the church for 45 years and I've seen this over and over again. I've seen people come into the church and they're like, help me, help me. And we're like, we don't know anything about you. We want to help you, but we don't know anything about you. And they only come in when it's a crisis. And then they expect everyone to take care of them. It's like, it would be like going to the doctor when everything has gotten so bad, it's almost irreparable. And the doctor's like, I can't do anything for you. If you would have come in here and I would have known your situation and been tracking with your situation, we could have done something, maybe even prevented this. 
And I see that a lot of times in the church. And people get mad. The church didn't help me in my time of need. They didn't even know who you were. You showed up and demanded help. And look, we're only human. We can't read your mind. We don't know your situation. And this sounds super blunt, but this is just what I've seen over and over again. People come to the church. They run to the church when everything hits the fan. And that's too late. Because if you don't have the safety of community over your head when things hit the fan, you're in deep trouble. And it takes a long time for people to get to know you and build a relationship with you. But if you've been in that community, then your marriage starts to struggle. There's people around you, and you're honest about it. People go, hey, man, you know what? Our marriage was struggling a few years ago. My husband was struggling with pornography or whatever. And you're like, well, that's what we're dealing with. Whatever it is. You get together, and people can help you. It's this, it's this safety over your head. But a lot of people are hanging out here, out here, and it starts raining on them. And they're like, I don't like getting rained upon. And then you're like trying to get in under the community, but it's too late. You've already gotten rained on. And you know, you know if you've ever seen, uh, I, I hear a lot of people say this. They say, well, you know, I don't need to go to church to be a Christian. I completely agree. You don't need to go to church to be a Christian. You know what else? You don't, need to, you don't even need to live with your spouse to be married. But not living in the same house with your spouse for long makes your marriage go south in a hurry, doesn't it? Not being around those people. You know, in the African savannah, we've all seen the documentaries. Which, what's the animal that gets picked off first? The one that got separated from the herd. It's the lion's guy. Yeah, I got this is an easy kill over here. I'll take it out. And there's this safety that comes in community. And, then, and when people know your... And, and look, yeah, who, know, who, who likes people knowing your hang-ups and your issues? I don't. I'd rather be like, you know, have this image that people are like, oh, Joel's got it all together. Y'all know I don't because I tell you all of my issues. But we want to have this image, but that's, there's, no, there's no safety in that because people can't come in and help you when you're really struggling. That's why Paul, he said this. He said, let's hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, that foundation, that logos, that truth. Let's hold fast to that. For he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. And no neglect meeting together. That means showing up whenever the church is meeting. As is the habit of some, but encouraging one another. And all the more as you see the day drawing near. Another trend I've seen over the last 45 years is people say, I don't understand why as soon as my kids got out of the house, they left the church and didn't want anything to do with it. I say, well, maybe because you, you didn't make church a priority. What you made instead a priority was soccer. Well, soccer, we all had to travel on Sundays. Yeah, well, maybe you need to pick another sport that doesn't travel on Sundays. Because we show our kids, you know, people say oftentimes, oh, I don't know why my kids don't, don't listen to me. Well, they don't listen to you because they're too busy watching you. And what you do reveals to your kids more what you believe than what you say. And if you don't really value the church and the community, your kids won't. What we do in moderation, our kids will do in excess. I, I grew up as a pastor's kid, never wanted to go to church. I hated the preacher, but <laughs> just kidding. I loved my dad, but I didn't like church. And he'd be like, I don't care what you think. You're going to church because we are part of a community, a family. Now, the primary family is the home family, but the secondary family is the community of believers. And he said, you don't get to not be part of the family. And there's a statistic out there that says that the kids that stay in the church after high school, there's one, a couple consistent things. And one of them is the kids got involved in serving before they were 15, and they had a mentor besides their parents in the community at the church. And that's what was the case for me. I had a mentor. He's still my mentor to this day. I'm 45 years old, and I still call him on a weekly basis. I met him when I was 16. David Nicholson. And he'll call me out, man. But I just, man, it, it, sometimes you need somebody besides your parents. But you, if you're taking them out to other places, they're not going to get that from the football team. I'm sorry. Only at church is where they're going to get that. And you've got to make church a priority. And here's another mistake I've seen, okay? And I've seen a lot of this from really good, God-loving people who homeschool their kids. Now listen, I'm a product of homeschool, so I got something to say about this. Here's what I've seen with homeschool families a lot of times. They go, well, it's us four and no more. We're the most important unit there is, the family. And so they, they'll skip church events to do family events. And look, I get that. That's really great. But us four and no more doesn't work. Or with homeschools, it's us 14 and no more. But uh, this is a joke. But anyway, 
I've seen this with homeschool, and it's well-intentioned, but you're, you're saying our little family is, not a, is, is more important than the big family, which is the community of believers. And I'm just telling you stuff I've seen. Okay, like I said, I've been hanging out in the church 45 years. I know I, I didn't mean to slap you all around this much. But community is super duper important. After committing your life to Christ, community is the tangible expression of Christ working in your life. He works through people, and that's the really complicated part, is that it's people that hurt us, but it's also people God uses to bring life, to bring healing, to bring a sense of feeling known, to bring a sense of feeling validated and loved. It's Christ, the body of Christ, the community of believers is, they are his hands and feet. Not only that, there's strength in it. That's what it says. Uh, King Solomon said this, two are better than one because they have a good reward for their toil. If they fall, one will lift up his fellow. But woe to him who is alone when he falls, that one little gazelle out there on the savanna running around by themselves. He has no one to lift him up. Again, if two lie together, they keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? And though a man might prevail against one who is alone, two will withstand him. A threefold cord is not quickly broken. Community is so important that we are, over the next few months, are going to be really making an intentional effort here at the church. We've seen the church growing and growing, We've kind of recovered from the COVID. Everybody's back at church now. And what we're launching in the next few months is our small groups because we want to make a place for you to be connected with others. The church has gotten a little bit big and Pastor Marcus can't be there for everyone. But he doesn't have to be there for everyone because that's not the way it's supposed to work. The way it's supposed to work is we're all supposed to be there for people in our circle. And the beauty of community groups that we're going to be launching, we're calling them grow groups, is you get involved with people throughout the week that are in, in your life and they know what's going on. They know when one of your family members is in the hospital. I was talking to Marianne earlier this week. She said, man, I have so many family members that when my, we lost my brother last week, they were just so alone. She's like, but I didn't feel alone at all. I had people from the church texting me and coming and checking on us and visiting us. She's like, I felt like this group of people supporting me. But man, woe to him who's alone in the middle of a struggle. And the church is people. Yes, us irritating people like me. We are the church. And when you get engaged with people, yeah, there's some struggles and you bump up against each other. And I don't like the way he does that. I don't like the way she does that. But you know what? There's this wonderful thing that happens when we're connected with others. So we're going to be really intentional over the next few months about doing these grow groups. So intentional that we brought my friend Doug in. Come on up here, Doug. This is Pastor Doug. He's from Atlanta. We brought my friend Pastor Doug in and he's been coaching some of our leaders on how to really develop a plan for discipleship. Not just a way that we can all come together and hang out, but really how do we grow in Christ in community? He is actually a decision scientist. Did you know that was a thing? It's a real, it's a real college degree. He's a decision scientist. He's an odd pastor. The, what, what caught my attention about him... You said that last time. Yeah. Really... What caught my attention about it is we were at a pastor's conference together. And somebody said, how long does it take to make a disciple? And the guy kind of ho-hummed around the expert. He's like, mm, it's, it's complicated. And afterwards, I met Doug. And Doug's like, that was an easy answer. He's like, it takes three years to make a disciple. I'm like, whoa, you're confident. And then I thought about it. I'm like, oh, snap. That's how Jesus did it, three years. So he started explaining what he's seen working with people throughout the years and how people grow in their faith. And he's developed this, this amazing kind of framework that we're going to be using to help people really step up and grow in their faith. So I want to ask him a couple questions. First question I want to ask is, why is community so imperative when it comes from what you've seen working with all these people all over the country? Why is community so important in becoming a disciple of Christ? Um, so I, I would say this. We all need friends, right? They're just really, even if you're an introvert, my wife's an introvert. But she still has, like, that group. Like, we have this need, right, for friends. And that's hardwired into us. Mm -hmm. So like, that is just part of who we are. And so, like, when the first relationship, I love the way you speak about this. So the first relationship that you get into as a Christian is your relationship with God, right? Okay. So immediately, he is our father, which means I have brothers and sisters. And so you already explained this. But by design, his system for completing me is other people. Mm. Like that's, that is just straight out of the Bible. So it's kind of like, well, I'm going to be a follower of Christ. Okay, good. So get saved. They're baptized. And then what now? And it's like, well, hang out with other believers, right? And hopefully smart ones, right? <laughs> that are going the right way. Um, so, but, but, but it's essential because 
like in, in, throughout the Bible, Romans 12, 1 Corinthians, Ephesians, you, you see these things where it says God gives, makes all kinds of different people with all these different gifts. And you see this in Joel and Marcus, right? It's entirely, totally different teachers. And it brings a power, a, a multiplied power to you, to this congregation, right? Okay, so you are designed by God to get that yourself all the time. It, and, but the problem is, is when things get a little bigger, it's, it's hard for that. I don't even know that guy back there. Hi. I don't know you. Oh, wrong guy. Okay, hi. So but it's hard for you to be in community with that guy. So you've got to find a way to do this. And, of course, you know my story. I didn't have any of this community, and I ended up with a lot of regrets, a lot of loneliness, a lot of mistakes. Yeah. yeah. So we complete ourselves. Yeah. It is. One of the things that I loved when I was talking to Doug, too, is, is he said, you know, there's a way to know if you're becoming a real follower of Christ. I was like, oh, I would like to know what the evidence is of that. And he came up with this really beautiful take on how to know if you're becoming a, fo- a, a, a real true follower of Christ. And he said it's these three things. They're prepared, they're confident, and they're skilled. And I think, man, how many of us wouldn't love to say that about our own faith? Yeah, I feel prepared in my faith to handle all the challenges in my life right now, the struggles with my boss. I, I feel confident that, you know, I, I know, like, God's leading me. I know where to go, what to do next. And then I'm, and you, you're skilled in navigating the unknown. Like, there's so many things. Like, so unpack that a little bit for us. This is the framework for what we're shooting for in all of us. We, we believe every one of us have the capacity to have this, to be prepared, confident, and skilled followers of Christ. Yep. So um, it's funny because we, we, we keep trying to talk and get word pictures for this. And uh, Marcus came up with one earlier. And he was like, like we want to be the chef, right, don't you? Like if you're going to work in a kitchen, you want to eventually be like the chef. So for most of my life, I was the dishwasher, yeah. <laughs> right? Is the guy scrubbing your garbage off plates, and it's like that. And I want, but you got to learn. You got to learn all these different things to be a chef, right? You got to learn how to do prep. You got to learn how to clean. You got to learn all the rules, and you learn salt and what is it? Salt, sour, and all those things. Yeah. Okay, savory, whatever it is, right? You get to do all that. Well, this is kind of that. So I don't know any single person I've ever met who doesn't want to rock life, right? Whether it's work or home or whatever. Well, now you're Christians. So there's a new recipe for this whole thing. And, and, and the key is, we, sometimes we have trouble finding those truths, right? Like we get the ones like, don't kill. Yes? Okay. Don't That's lie. a hard one for me. No, I'm just kidding. Apparently so lately. <laughs> Apparently so lately. Um, I'm afraid I may be one of those people in his community who's pushed him. So, uh, but he hasn't murdered me yet. All right, good. So, but you get this. So it's really important. This idea of prepared is I don't just know what to do, but I know why. Which, which I think that's what was a frustrating thing for school with, with me. They'd be like, you have to know this. Well, why? Just learn it. So the I want to know why. Yeah. Yeah, so I'll explain it to you in context. So he's always teasing how we came out to help work on the land out there, the, the retreat. And he's like, and he would come in and go, what are you doing? And we're like, oh, we're just kind of straightening this thing up real quick. We're we'll putting it in. It's a little crooked. Oh, yeah. He'd, he'd go, man, they really messed this up. I'm like, they is me. And I messed this up. And we were still pretty new friends. I mean, we were, we were getting our, we were way better now. But we were still new. And I was like, ah. Oh. But then you'd explain why. Yeah, and I'd be because like, he didn't, oh, learn, he I didn't, didn't learn geometry. No. See, that's why you learn geometry. The why of school is geometry and a thing called a 90 degree angle. And so this is like, with, this is like the thing with our life. Okay, this is the thing with our life. Like we, yeah. <laughs> and I learned out why when we were putting the cabinets in, and the, the, the wall was leaned in. You can't put a square cabinet in a wall that's leaning in. Anyway, Emily walks out. She goes, "There's like a bow in that wall." I go, "Yeah, <laughs> some things can't be fixed." Anyway, but it's, you, you go like, so. But it's really important to not just know that you shouldn't murder somebody, but why shouldn't you murder? And it sounds crazy because it seems so obvious. But, but really, we have access to all that in the Bible, but probably a lot of you are scared of the Bible, right? I mean, it's, really, it's intimidating. And then the history's boring and all that. I hear all that stuff, but I can promise you, like I can promise you, there's a way that you can read the Bible where all this, and just, just like read it, like, and, and all of a sudden you're going to be like, dude, that's why, all on your own. Mm. Like no textbook, nothing. It's just this cool thing that God has been doing since creation, we kind of forgot. And let's talk about this in, in the modern day, because right now where there's this big hot thing called deconstruction. Everybody's deconstructing their faith. 
where somebody told them what they believe, but they never explained the why to them. And so they're questioning everything. And there's a why to everything God asks of us, but a lot of times we weren't taught that. And so as you get older, you start questioning everything and they walk away from the faith because nobody took the time to give them the why of it. And that's, that's is huge in our culture right now. So many people are walking away from the faith because they're like, nobody understood that there is a reason that we don't move an ancient boundary stone. There is a reason we follow the Ten Commandments. It's not just God up there making random assignments. There's a reason why. And that's why it, it, your faith becomes strong as you go, well, that's why he said that. Because if, if you don't do this, you end up with everything we see in the world today going wrong. So Yeah, so, so the first way you know if you're like moving forward in this relationship with him being a follower and it's working is you start not only just having data, you know, truths, but you begin to understand the why. But I love the second one because for me, the second one is like where it really crystallizes. When you're doing this on your own, you don't need somebody nagging you and, and you come to church and you worship because you worship and not because somebody says, hey, join my this awesome stuff. Stand up and worship, you know, but, but it, where you're doing this on your own and, and I compare that to being like in a high chair, okay? So like, I don't want to be in a high chair right now because I think that would be embarrassing, right? It would be really, really embarrassing. It, it might help you at, with sitting at the table, but, you know. Anyways. I'm not coming to help you anymore. Okay, so, um, but, but I don't want to be in a high chair. Like, I want to feed myself babies. They get this, right? And they want to get out there and run on their own. And don't you, like, like don't you, like, just really want to whip life and, and do it on your own. It's not that you don't need community because the whole point of this is you do, they complete you. But their goal is to complete you so that you can. And, and I really want to, I don't want to be in a high chair. I don't want to be in diapers. Like I, I want to be able to like look at this stuff and figure it out. There's a verse in Galatians where Paul says something weird. He says, each one should look after the burdens of another because everyone needs to carry their own burden. You're like, well, which one is it? Well, we help others with their burden so ultimately they can carry their own burden. And sometimes it's just too heavy. You can't carry it on your own. But as we come around them, we go, hey, if you do this, take a little weight off of here, you can carry your own burden. We all have to take up our responsibility. We talked about this a few weeks ago. We have to carry our own cross. But that's the beauty of community is you're, you're really learning to follow on your own as, as people have kind of lifted you up and said, you don't need the pastor. You don't need to call the pastor on every decision. You don't need to be... Uh, you know, depending on, you know, somebody outside, you can look to the Bible yourself and the Holy Spirit reveal to you what the answer is on this. You use the example of what car should I buy? Yes. Or like, yeah, yeah. Here in the so bottom, the, yeah. the, the third one, I looked at Joel and I was like, hey, so what car are you going to buy? Depends what you're trying to do. Right. Yeah. <laughs> right? But like, who do you date? Where do you go to school? How do you handle this relationship? So I'm just to say this, and sometimes they say I'm controversial, but I, it really is true. There are not, you know, straightforward clear-cut answers for all of life's problems, like in the Bible, like it doesn't say, Doug, buy a Honda. You know what I mean? It doesn't say, hey, Mary, Mary Bob. You know, like, because the book would be really thick and none of us would be interested. Yeah. But so the question is, how do you figure that out? And that's actually the, this is the end goal. So like, like just, if you, if you get kind of going as a disciple and you let somebody coach you and guide you, it's kind of like, well, I was swinging pretty good and I was batting, you know, 200. But I'm batting three now because I went because this guy knows how to bat. Yeah. So, so then in the group, there's somebody else who's a great thrower, and they help you to teach throw. And all of a sudden, you, what happens is you, you take that throwing skill that God taught you, that truth, and then you take this thing that God taught you, and all of a sudden, you can answer things like, what car do I buy? Should I marry this girl? Should I date this girl? It, you, you become the complete package. You become you know, a pro player. Because you've, you've learned the principles of how things work. That's the thing. My dad always said this, wisdom is skillful living. It's being able to live with skill because you understand the principles of how the world works. An airplane breaks the laws of physics, but because they learn the laws, they're able to fly working within the laws that God put in place, the principles. And the same is true in the spiritual world with the principles in place. When you learn those principles, life just gets a lot less complicated as you learn, I, I can navigate the unknown. I've never done this, never raised kids before, but I know that there's principles that apply here. Never gone through a financial struggle like this before, but I know there's principles that apply. And as you do that, you become this confident disciple, follower of Christ. And not only is it good for you, it's good for your family. You're raising up your family. You're raising up those around you. And you're, you're literally letting your light shine before men that they may see your good works glorify 
your Father in heaven. You got anything to close with? Um, and I would say this, the more complete you become, the more complete I become, the stronger this church becomes. I mean, ultimately it's about you. He died so you have an abundant life. And so like when all the garbage hits, you, I, don't you want to be, like just real show of hands, like if, when life happens, don't you want to be prepared yeah. and confident and like skilled, right? Yeah. So the cool part about it is if you get prepared, confident, and skilled, you can avoid some of that stuff. Yeah. Which is it's like way just even better. And so a, a lot of times we will hear things like this, like framework, you know, program, what, commitment, this different kind of small group. What I want to tell you is this, like thousands of people across the country have just engaged in this and, and, and in like two or three weeks and then in a couple months they're just like, holy cow. So when they're talking about life groups, like, it, you know, this kind of maybe more formal discipleship process, which just gives you, it's, it's like exponential growth. You could do this in 80 years, you could do it in eight, but you can do it like in a year. Mm -hmm. Like you can get access and you can learn and you can begin to, to get these things. But I just want to say, just don't be intimidated by it. Like, if you get the opportunity to get, like, a great guide, because you get a great guide, and that guide will just kind of walk you there, but they're going to point you to God, and you, it's so easy. So, like, whatever, I would just say whatever, when you have this opportunity, of, of course, I'm going to say don't pass it up, because my life stank, and it doesn't anymore, and a bunch of other people, too, and Christianity became easy, hmm. and being a follower became easy, and, and I actually lived that fulfilled like, you're in my life because of this. Hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, so just don't think it's difficult. And, oh, yeah. yeah. Let, me, let me encourage you guys. Some of you guys, I mean, I know a lot of y'all's stories. Some of you are like one decision away from really taking your life to the next level. And that one decision is, I'm going to really get tied in with the community and the church of believers. I'm going to stop trying to figure it out on my own. I'm going to stop just showing up on Sunday, bailing out of here as fast as I can. I'm actually going to get tied in. And you, you're one decision away from seeing your family go to a level you never could have thought possible. You're one decision from seeing your marriage. And that decision is the commitment to really be involved in building your life on the foundation of God's word and then being surrounded by fellow believers. And it's, it's a wonderful, wonderful feeling. You're going to find yourself more often than not going, people, I love them. I love people because God loves people. And as he puts that love in your heart and you see the gift that he, people are, the community is to us, that we don't have to feel like we're alone. God's up there so distant. No, he's tangibly with us and around us and the people we've decided to connect our lives to. And it's a place of safety. It's a place of confidence. So my prayer for you guys is that, that you would be engaged in community. And it's going to take some, it, it takes some work. It's not going to happen by default. You might have to cancel some other events. You might have to, you know, God forbid, you might have to cancel some sports events or maybe do a little bit less. Uh, was it uh, Meister Eckhart said, the kingdom of God is more about subtraction than addition. Sometimes you got to subtract stuff to really seek the kingdom of God. So my prayer for you is that you make this a priority. So I'm going to pray for you guys uh, this morning. Lord, we thank you so much that you've given us tangible expression of who you are through people around us, even though they frustrate us, they irritate us sometimes. Sometimes we just want to be left alone. But we know that your love is shown to us through people that are around us. So I pray for anyone this morning that's struggling relationally. Lord, I pray that you just, just put it in their heart that they need to link up with somebody and share their struggles, share their problems, and, and, and just trust that you're going to speak to them the wisdom they need through the Word of God and through those people around us. Uh, if you're here this morning, you have not given your, your heart to Jesus, you haven't started that relationship, and you already know who you are as I've been talking, you've already been feeling it. I'm going to say a prayer in just a second. If you say this prayer, and you mean it with your whole heart. God is going to come and forgive all your sins. He's going to transfer you from the kingdom of darkness and give you an eternal address in the kingdom of light. It starts as we say this. Let's all say this prayer together. Lord Jesus, we repent of our sin. We turn from our way. We turn to your way. Help us walk in your truth. Amen. Hey, if you just said that prayer, welcome to the kingdom of God. We got some resources for you to help you in the back. And listen, it's so easy to walk out of here and go, oh, we'll start doing that next month. Don't wait. Do it now. Next week, we're going to have sign-ups for small groups uh, that you can get involved and tied in with that. There's all sorts of the groups will be listed on the app. Figure out a way you're going to get committed to community this fall. You guys be blessed. Have a great week. You're dismissed. If you are ever in the Seguin area, come visit us on Sunday mornings at 9 or 11 a.m. Or you can just download our app and receive our weekly messages right to your phone. Just text CC Seguin 
to 77977 and click on the link that you receive. May the remainder of your week be enriched with God's favor and blessings.